This is part 10 in a series of videos in which I am repairing an IBM 5120 vintage computer system. So far in this series I've gone through the chassis, it was in a terrible state, a lot of corrosion, I've um, been working on the power supply, I've stripped this supply right down, um, checked all the capacitors, I've put a new um, mains cable on, the old one had been cut off, and I've been going through the power supply. This is a uh, a switch mode power supply um, but unfortunately I don't have any schematics for this machine if anyone has one I'd uh, very much appreciate a copy and uh, I've been going through the power supply and um, it, it is working but I'm not absolutely happy with it just yet the 5 volt rail uh, seems a bit high when it's unloaded it does drop down to 5 volts once there's a load on it but um, I'm a bit concerned about how high the voltage is under very light load. It does fall within spec once it's got 30 or 40 milliamps on it but uh, even so I need to look at that a bit more carefully before I risk plugging anything in. Uh, I have refinished the metal work on the um, power supply as I say I've been right through it. I've taken all the uh, suspect components out and tested them and I've also been going through a lot of the other metal work uh, components. There's a lot of corrosion on most of them. They start like this uh, and what I've been doing is uh, stripping them um, as I showed in the previous video and then refinishing them so they uh, end up coming out like this uh, which is obviously a, a huge improvement and it'll really help to uh, make the machine uh, look a lot better if I can get it working. Unfortunately there are quite a few metal components so I'm working my way through them, finishing them off as I come to them and then refitting them uh, as they're required. So I've gone as far as I can with the supply without doing a lot more testing or getting some information on it. So I'm going to slot it back into the chassis, um, readjust the main switch. As I said, this switch needs to be adjusted uh, to properly line up with the case. Um, so I'll do that next, get this done. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the interconnect chassis as well. That's the one I showed um, being refinished in the previous video. And, uh, and then we'll see how all this um, fits together in the chassis. So the power supply just slides in, in the same way that the electronics box did. Uh, this connector is the power connector that goes through to the electronics box. So it comes down this side and then through this opening. And then there's a clamp plate that goes on here. But I've got to take the supply out again to do some more testing on it. So I won't uh, fit that just yet. And uh, all the other interconnect wires just run around the um, chassis. Uh, but before we can fit anything else into this part of the machine, we need to put the um, intermediate platform uh, in place. Again, I'm going to leave it off for now. I want to uh, essentially test the machine in two parts. I want to test the supply and then start fitting the cards one by one. Uh, and of course, plug in the keyboard and the monitor and uh, start to try and bring it back to life um, bit by bit and I do need to keep an eye on the uh, 5 volt power supply to make sure that it, uh, it behaves itself. The other um, supply lines seem fine, they're all well within spec. Um, I've done full load tests on them using the Kunkin electronic loads and um, they all seem fine. Um, but once I've got it uh, to the point where I want to start plugging the cards in, uh, what I'll do is I'll post another video of the uh, supply under a full load test before I plug it in, just to make sure that uh, it's behaving itself and we're not going to blow the cards up um, when I install them. Uh, as I said before, the components on these cards are extremely hard to get hold of, and so I don't want to uh, damage any um, by um, plugging them into a supply that's not working correctly. I've also now completed the interconnect um, assembly. So this is the assembly that sits in the center uh, on the top platform and it connects the electronics uh, through to the floppy drives. And so I'll need this to uh, test the system once I start connecting the floppy drives together. I'll get the chassis out of the way and we'll take a look at the interconnect module and I'll show you the approach I'm taking and it will be the same approach that I'll take with the electronics box. So this is how far I've got with the interconnect module and uh, this is the uh, assembly we looked at refinishing the metal work in the previous video and um, you can see it's starting to look fairly reasonable uh, but of course the main uh, task is to try to see if this is all working 
And the problem that I have, of course, with a unit like this is lack of information. Uh, in particular, um, the modules that uh, we see here, the silver cans, are uh, IBM uh, custom modules. I will be posting a separate video on these, um, but just to briefly touch on, on what they are and how I'm going about testing them. They were uh, developed in the 60s and 70s by IBM alongside uh, monolithic ICs. And what's in here is normally a ceramic base, sometimes multi-layer, and on that ceramic base um, they deposited or attached in various different ways um, individual components, so transistors, resistors, capacitors, crystals, that sort of thing. And they form a small circuit element. It's kind of like a, a mini uh, circuit in its own right. And each module type has a different circuit in, inside. Uh, not only that, but they operate on different voltages, different speeds. There's a whole range of these. And they were originally developed um, by IBM when they started work on their uh, step from uh, room size mainframes and they try to miniaturize them. And it's not just the modules that are part of this system. You can see the board layout itself um, is a bit strange. And that's part of the system they developed, uh, not just for the uh, design and manufacture, but for automated design and documentation. And this all works hand in hand, so these boards are kind of a, a, a grid uh, array system. And it's a bit like the way you would design using an FPGA today, in that you define what certain areas of the board are for, and then you kind of uh, plant different uh, circuit elements in those locations. And then the automated software system they had would interconnect them depending on how they've uh, designed the circuit. Uh, the problem is, of course, um, because these are sealed and the information for them is hard to come by, it's very difficult to fault find on these. It would be quite easy to make replacement modules if we just know what's inside them. Um, and the approach I'm taking here is I do have some information on these and I've been trying to uh, decode the various uh, part numbers and see what information I've got and whether I have schematics for each of these modules. So to give you an idea of what might be in here, I've printed one of the spec sheets off and we get something like this. So there's quite a few of these on the power supply, which is why I started with this one. And so for uh, this circuit in particular, uh, you can see that the uh, part numbering is relatively straightforward. Um, there's just uh, there's several numbers on the modules, but they're not just for the part number. They also relate to locational information and coordinates as well. Um, but what we're interested in here really is uh, this particular number and so it's this one says uh, 361497 and if you look through the uh, spec sheets uh, for these modules you'll see that it's a crystal oscillator and the part numbering system also indicates the pinout profile so it's kind of like a, a BGA almost um, uh, in terms of its layout so if you turn these round and look at the back of the board, I don't know how clearly this will come across, but uh, what you have on the back is a very similar layout to uh, a BGA uh, system. But they're multi-layer boards and each of these pads is effectively a via. So um, what you can do is just specify point-to-point -point wiring. It's a bit like wire wrapping, but uh, in a, a, a grander automated uh, scheme and the tracks are very fine tracks that are uh, run between the vias. Um, again, I'll do some uh, close-ups through the microscope when I uh, post the video on these. Uh, but the part numbering doesn't just include the circuit information, that's what's in the module. It also includes information about where it's supposed to be placed, um, the uh, pin numbering sequence, they have different ways of numbering the pins and sometimes it goes uh, from the left corner up and round and other times it goes the other way. Um, so it's a very slow and tedious process trying to decode all this and you have to figure out which pins which. And so what I've been doing is on the modules I can identify I've been figuring out which pins which and then using just uh, with it powered off using a, 
um, a multimeter is just trying to take some readings and see if what I can read uh, actually makes sense and if there seems to be any shorts, anything open, if there's an active device I'll try and uh, check it as a, uh, for example a transistor, a diode array uh, you can sometimes check depending on which external pins you have access to so a module like this there's what amounts to a transistor here and so what you can do is using the three pins that you do have access to you can test it as a transistor and see if it uh, seems to be working so that's what I've been doing it is uh, very tedious and um, all I'm really trying to do here is that if there are any faulty ones um, I probably can't pick it up at this point but what I can try and do is try and detect if there's any shorts or anything that could damage other modules uh, and that's what I'm looking for so that's what I've done with this so far I've been through all the uh, modules in here I can uh, sensibly identify and uh, tested them and hopefully I can at least minimize any damage that may occur when I finally power this up uh, again if anyone's got any information on these modules um, any uh, lists part lists um, any information on them whatsoever then I'd uh, appreciate anything that uh, you can send um, also the goal is to try and get this um, IBM up and running I've been going through all the easy things so far the, the general restoration metalwork etc is very straightforward uh, but we're now we're getting towards the point where uh, I need to start doing actual fault finding and as we go through the cards in the electronics box they're all very similar to this and you'll see that um, there's even a, a weird mix of um, these hybrid modules and monolithic ICs as well and some of these modules contain nothing more than a monolithic IC with a pinout that suits uh, IBM's development system because obviously it made more sense for them to have something like this in this package because their automated design system uh, worked with these so they'd quite often just put something like this on a die within a module and then they could uh, put that into their CAD system which is effectively what they were using and uh, again even with the interconnect and the connectors uh, that was part of the system that they developed and it was it's quite a nice system but uh, like most things it was way over complicated and um, if you look into it in more detail you'll see that it's kind of a, a rabbit hole once you start going down it that um, the information that you need to fully uh, appreciate it and investigate it um, is almost endless uh, but as I say I will do a video on that and then if that uh, does generate any interest and, and you want to know more then just uh, let me know